theme for this year is Grand Rising. And the theme for August is On Status Quo. So you may have noticed that today's service is not unfolding in its usual manner. <laughs> Why, you ask? We've come to expect a status quo in our spiritual community. We tend to know what to wear, who will see, what the topics will be, when the music and treatment will happen, everything. When we only operate in the status quo, we miss so much of the beauty and growth that happens when we move outside our normal and step into the beyond the unstatus quo. This month, we're looking at changing things up from how the service unfolds to what we deem as appropriate to talk about as spiritual beings. It is going to be uncomfortable at times, exciting at other times, but we promise you it won't be boring and things are going to shift in you and for you. So hold on and let's enjoy the unstatus quo. Today's topic is the impact of othering and help me welcome April up for our talk. So as everyone knows, I usually start with a joke. I don't have one today. Does anyone else have a good joke? Come on, don't be shy. Jeff, you got a joke? Okay. Okay. Well, we'll work it. Um, why, must the mel why must melons get married in a church? <laughs> why must melons get married in a church? Because they can't alone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's wonderful. So, crazy day. How many are completely confused about where we're at right now? Fear of you? Beth? <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Um, can I get 11 just brought down? I seem to be yelling again like I like to do. So, this month is all about breaking our norms, the way we do things, the way we show up here. So today, thankfully, I had some people willing to work with me to deconstruct our service. And what I find so interesting is I attempted to deconstruct some of it. I ended up deconstructing all of it because if you were trying to sing along, that was a challenge unless you knew the song. Um, moving things this morning because I'd done the PowerPoint earlier in the week and then I had this epiphany that oh, we should do this. We should just mess with it all and have fun. So hopefully it gives you a laugh, because I'm sure there's more of this to come. Uh, some that will probably be happening right now in the talk. So today's topic is about othering. And we have talked about this before. And I probably will repeat some things you've heard before. And hopefully bring in some new stuff. But I found this really wonderful little video. And what I love about it is it's just a very concise idea of what othering is. Because sometimes I think we all have our own notion of what othering looks like. So I'm just going to get Elizabeth to play the video really quick. And hopefully this will work. <laughs> and sound. Let's get started. Here we go. being the other, I'm Dr. Dwight Turner, and what we're going to do today is we're talk a bit about the notion of othering. We're going to keep this one fairly brief for this week, because I think it's about, about time we went back and had a look at just what is othering. This is a phrase that's used quite a lot in sociology and in uh, psychology cycle circles, less so perhaps in psychotherapy, something probably needs to be used a lot more in psychotherapy, but it's a concept that actually helps us to get an idea of just what happens when we stereotype or we objectify somebody, for example. 
In, for example, the sociological perspective, othering occurs when we actually forget or we ignore the humanity, the innate humanity of an individual, and we actually make that person our other. We project onto them aspects of ourselves that we don't want to see. So, for example, if um, you want to see me as a man of colour, as an angry black man, for example, whilst denying their own anger, they don't want to recognise who I am within my own inherent humanity, then they'll project that aspect onto myself, irrespective of whether they know me or not. I remember in the very first episode of this series of podcasts, I talked to yourself about an example where I was seen as a bouncer, as opposed to being a psychotherapist. That's a form of stereotyping, a form of othering, because it ignores who I am, which is a psychotherapist, a doctor, an academic, and actually projects onto me what the other person has, the other person views men of colour like myself. It's as simple as that, if you like. There is another angle, though, to othering. This is quite important to recognise, that othering can be done to oneself. And this is where, like, a Lacanian perspective is actually very useful in understanding this. Because Lacan actually recognised um, in his studies that what, we, what, the, um, what the conscious part of ourselves, what the egoic part of oneself can do, is actually other the unconscious part of ourselves. So we separate ourselves, we form a false self, and then we other that part which then is actually our true self, perhaps projecting that one out into other people around us. From a psychotherapist, psychotherapist perspective, this is quite important to recognise. Self-othering, the denial of who we actually happen to be, is just as uh, painful and just as problematic as the othering that we receive from others outside of us. In fact, the two can often go hand in hand and can create huge psychological problems if, we, if, they're, if they're left unchecked. This is what othering actually is. It's hugely important to recognise. Now, the only way that we can actually move beyond othering on a conscious level is by re recognizing, for example, the person opposite us, say the person that's in, in Costa who's serving us coffee, is a regular human being and is not just a barista whose name we don't know, who we expect to do a certain job because that's what they're supposed to do. For ourselves, in the, on an internal level, there's something about acknowledging our own cultural, gender, sexual heritage, who we happen to be underneath the surface and not ignoring that, not othering ourselves in order to fit in with whatever the majority wants of us. Very important. Like I said, this can go both ways. So othering, as I've already stated in other videos, and also I'm going to be stating this one, can be a very painful and psychological judgment, mental process, but it's one that can be moved beyond if we're willing to actually acknowledge who we are. Thank you. And if other people are willing to acknowledge who we are as well. That's one of the problems with the world at the moment. We're not always able to do that. That's great. Like I said, so it's going to be a, a brief... So, oh, I'll turn back up 11. <laughs> That's okay, I do that all the time. And I'm done, thank you very much. No. <laughs> so, what was really interesting, and I love this perspective, is we talk all the time about our divine center who we are underneath of it all. When the personality disappears, when we're not in a time and place, when we're not being judged by the personality, that divine, beautiful core of what we truly are. So when we get separated from that, when we allow ourselves to think we're our thoughts or our personality, and we move away from this idea of this constant connection to source, right? We're othering who we truly are. We are saying that there are two separate forms of April and there isn't. There is this divine being standing in front of you <laughs> and there is the personality that is representing it in this incarnation, in this spiritual goal route. Same with all of you. So what happens when we get separate is fear comes into play. And we forget that we're in control. We forget that we have the power over our thoughts, over ourselves, over how we react to things. So what is so beautiful about this idea of othering is when we're in that place where we're feeling separate from our connection to the divine, it's when other things bubble up. 
It's when other fears bubble up. It's when the other on this physical plane show up. So I'm pretty comfortable in a lot of different groups. And then you find yourself in a place where you're culturally surrounded by a completely different group. And it takes a bit of adjustment because you're, you're sort of like, oh, you're watching things, you don't want to be inappropriate, you want to fit in culturally, you want to do everything like everyone else is doing, and, and you don't want to look judgy or that you're a fish out of water. So fear kind of steps in, right? It's like, oh, I'm not the same as everything. It's a little uncomfortable. It's a little, um, at times, off-putting, even though you're really enjoying yourself, even though you might have had that experience if you went to Folklorama to a pavilion that you're not familiar with and people are speaking a different language and you're like, oh, you know, I didn't know any of this stuff and it can be fun. And yet you're continually thinking in your mind how they're different. And oh, they do this different and they do that different. And the brain does this very naturally. We want to label everything around us, especially people, because hey, when our forefathers were sitting in a cave and someone showed up, you wanted to be really quick at figuring out if they were there to do you in or if they were there to help you build a fire. So this trying to figure this out, trying to figure out if your friend or foe, this othering, is kind of in our flight and fright, right? So I had this experience of recently going to uh, the Africa Cup soccer game. And um, my niece had called me and she said, oh, um, my nephew is playing for Egypt. He's not Egyptian, but that's another story. And she said, why don't you come on down and watch? She said, it is such a fun atmosphere. She said, it's just great. So sure enough, my husband and my son and I, we head on down and we get there and I did not realize this, but the crowd was predominantly black. And I mean, predominantly, like 96, 97% black. We sat down, it was so much fun. The chanting, the, the heckling was different. Um, there was just such a vibrancy, there was such an excitement to it all. And, and uh, you know, I wasn't feeling so self-conscious after a little while, because I'll be perfectly honest, I'm like, they're gonna wonder what the heck these three are doing at this game. And then um, I'm sitting there and I was talking, one of my nieces came over and I was talking to her and I feel this tap on my shoulder and I turn around and there's a young man sitting behind me and he's got a little girl on his lap and he said, hi. And I said, oh, hi. And then I'm thinking desperately, right? Oh my gosh, who are you? I do not remember your name. Like I must have met you at the center or something, but I don't remember your name. And I said, I said again, hi, because he's just smiling at me. And he said, hi, he said, what's your name? And so then I realized a relief, I didn't forget somebody. I said, my name's April. And he said, well, it's really nice to meet you, April. And then he turns to his daughter and he said, see, that's how easy it is to make a friend. So I said back to him, what's your name? And he said, Marcel. He says, lovely to meet you, Marcel. And then his daughter looks at me, she goes, are you really friends? He goes, are we friends, April? I said, absolutely. That was one of my favorite memories from this summer because it was this unexpected interaction where there was no otherness, absolutely no otherness. It was two people taking an opportunity to teach a little girl how easy it is to make a friend, right? But we miss those opportunities if we don't put ourselves in those initially kind of awkward situations, right? So why do we create this otherness? You know, I, I hinted a little bit into the flight and fright, but we also connect we, with otherness in order to show we're not something, which is gonna sound a little contradictory and it is. But how many of us bring up that we have perhaps a really close indigenous friend? Or we bring up that, yeah, you know, just sort of like I did with the soccer team, that I went to this, you know, soccer event. 
And they said that is actually a, a really different way of othering because it's to show I'm not like the others. I don't judge people on, on their ethnic background or how they present. I don't see any of that, right? So we have a tendency when we talk about other people and we're bringing up the negativity about them, that's us trying to say, I'm not that. I don't have that in me. But the truth is, if you're calling it, you're being it. So we believe, and anyone here, if this is the first time hearing this, let me know, but we create our reality. Is that a surprise to anybody? <laughs> no, no, good. I don't have to go into that lecture. We create a reality. So if I meet someone, my initial thoughts are, he's really different, I'm uncomfortable with them. You know, I think there's something going on I don't really trust. Who's responsible for that experience? Me, 100%. And in this teaching, even though it's incredibly uncomfortable at times, we have to stop and say, where is this coming from? Where in me is this feeling? Where in me is this insecurity? Where in me, as he said, when people look at him and saw him as an angry black man, where in your, re in your consciousness are you creating that idea of an angry black man? Because it's your creation. So what I love about this is it's also our opportunity to clean it. So now in situations where I'm like, hmm, why did that happen? Why did I have that feeling? Why did, why did I move? I stop as soon as I can. And number one, forgive myself for having the thought. Number two, cleanse it. And then I cleanse it by saying, I love you. I love you, I love you. I let, let spirit in, because the minute you say, I love you, I've mentioned this before, it's like spirit taking this big old eraser and cleaning the chalkboard for you. And the more you do it, the less you fall into this idea of othering. And this othering just doesn't have to do with other cultures, other ethnic groups. It can be othering people with disabilities, othering people with mental illness. There's a multitude of areas that this falls into. So what I would ask you is challenge that when it comes up. Why am I feeling that way? Don't be angry at yourself, just be aware of it. And then cleanse, then let it go. And the more you do that, the more you will find that you are not othering the divine within you. That connection becomes stronger and more fulfilling and the life you want to create becomes easier. So when we move through these ideas of other, and there's one um, final one, politics is another area of, of yeah, I'm going there, people. <laughs> Hold on to your hats, especially if they're mega. <laughs> Othering. It is a political technique. It is being infiltrated into our social media. It's being infiltrated into our news. It's being infiltrated into our uh, politicians' statements, etc. The whole reason for it is it works. It creates fear that either gets you to go out and vote for one or the other or stay home and not vote. It is a corrosive political strategy and it is coming up here. Now I'm cleansing the whole time I'm saying this, so I realize that I'm creating it every time it comes into my experience. But it's also something that we have to pay attention to as a collective. Because no matter which side you fall on, and that does not matter to me one iota, but no matter what side you fall on, we have to find the middle ground. We have to stand up for each other and always know the divinity in the other and not the other, let's take that word back, in that person and in yourself realizing that you're the one recognizing the difference. You're the, uh, the one othering them. So when we make a joke about Trump, we're othering. When we make a joke about Polyev or Trudeau, we're othering. 
when we make a joke about Jagmeet Singh or any of our own politicians, we are othering. The person that we need to cleanse is ourselves. And why is that important? To, to do it for ourselves. Why is all that inner work so important? Anybody? Sorry? Heal the world, because if we take care of that othering within ourselves, if we connect to spirit within ourselves at all times, we are cleansing a huge part of this world. And it doesn't take time between before Sylvia does it, Bev does it, Barb does it, Shona does it, Ian does it, where we get to the group where it's the, the majority of this room. The majority of this room changes this center, and this center changes a lot of lives, whether in this building or other places. So, when you feel like you're judging someone's fate, when you feel like you're judging someone's color, ethnic background, if you feel like you're judging someone's opinion, realize it's in you. The othering is in you. You will never change someone's mind by telling them how wrong they are, telling them how what they believe in is totally caca. Any of those things, right? Because that, that, nobody ever changes that way. But if you go inside and you take care of the othering in yourself, you'll be so amazed how that disappears from your reality. I've seen it time and time again. I've experienced it so many times. And trust me, doing the inner work is so much more valuable and rewarding than trying to change everyone else, which never works. So we have seen a wonderful example of this. And I only mention it because I thought it was kind of funny. Donald Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance, brought up that Kamala Harris, for those of you who may not know, has run the Democratic nomination to run for president. J.D. Vance made a comment about that you couldn't really have a woman that never had children, and as he referred to her, crazy cat lady. So, I love this Instagram. I looked for it, I couldn't find it, but there was an Instagram Post of a bunch of women from the 40s, and they all had like black cats at their feet. It must have been a joke for Halloween or something. And it said, registering to vote. <laughs> and I loved it because it was taking something that was supposed to be othering and, and just taking it on, just having fun with it, right? Which is also taking care of it in yourself and not just being angry. So Ernest Holmes had said this quote, it doesn't take a declaration or an evasion to start a war. It only takes is an us and a them and a spark. So I'll end with one final little story. The women's soccer team for the Olympics was playing yesterday for Canada and I was deconstructing the service at that time. And I went to watch. My husband and son were watching in the basement. I could hear them going, ah, oh, like, oh, I couldn't stand it anymore. So I had to see what was happening. So I put it on. I honestly had it on for two minutes. So Germany had a possession. And then I shut it off and ran out of sight so that I couldn't hear them. And I'm out there going, what in the world is going on with me? Like, why am I so invested? in the soccer team and yes i i love sports and yes i love women's soccer i think it's amazing to watch but i mean i was ridiculous you would have thought every one of those girls was my daughter the way i was feeling i mean i was emotionally bereft at this and i had to stop and think what is it about wanting them to win so badly and then i realized it had nothing to do with them and everything to do with my emotions and my feeling that I couldn't handle their loss emotionally, that I just couldn't take the unfairness of it, that I just wanted to see something work out 
the way I wanted it to. And then it came to me, well, then cheer Germany. And it was like, oh, but I, we laughed because we said, isn't it interesting? Because the Olympics play imagine every Olympics, right? And the, the main point of that is imagine there's no borders. I mean, it's basically a contradiction to exactly what's happening. So I heard a, a, another little post and the fellow said, wouldn't the Olympics be more interesting if citizens just received a letter that told them that they had to participate this year in a chosen event, I would watch that. And I thought that was too funny. So there was my otherness showing up again, right? Why couldn't I be just as excited for the girls that identified as German as I did for the girls from Canada? So it's interesting, right? We all have our otherness. I'm still cheering for the Jets. I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to deal with that reality within myself. You know, I'm gonna be other in Calgary and Edmonton, I know it. I'm, I'm owning up to that. But let's find ways as a group that we can individually look at our otherness and, and get people that don't look exactly or think exactly like us in this building. Because that brings in knowledge, that brings in new ideas, that brings in the unstatus quo. And that's how we grow and change and enjoy everything that we have together, multitude by a hundred. It's gonna be wonderful and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much.